Wow. <clears throat> Notes. So they didn't want to have a service because they didn't have any friends left. Um, <laughs> got you again. Um, they really ought to do these things a lot, a lot, uh, lot longer after someone dies so it could actually feel like a celebration. Because that's what it is. Um, it's a celebration of a life well lived. 88 years, almost 89. Um, married 65, as he'd say, but it was 64 in a month. Um, so a couple deadlines missed that I think he would be a, a little upset he, he missed, but it uh, doesn't matter. It's a celebration. So I'm not going to read the whole obituary because, as you've seen, it's extremely long, and it could have been extremely longer. And uh, if you can't tell from the program the way it's laid out, uh, Brian Young would be appalled with his early graphic arts lessons. Um, but uh, we managed to fit it all on the page, and uh, you can read that as you go. But uh, I'll touch on a few things maybe that, that are repeats. But uh, uh, if you grew up in the Church of Christ and you sang a little sang out of a hymnal, you knew a guy named Tillett S. Tedley. Um, and if you happen to be a song leader, um, then you probably got a lot of pressure from my dad to lead his songs. Because Tillett S. Tudley was my dad's great uncle and he was super proud of that. Um, and uh, Bryce, thanks for leading today. And uh, I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and give you some leeway because again, dad insisted on leading all the verses. And Uncle Tillett um, was adamant that they not be sung at too fast of a tempo. So, so Bryce, if, if you need to save some time, I'd like to get us out of here two and a half to three hours. Um, so feel free to, to cut a few verses or ramp it up. Um, but yeah, singing, singing was a big, big part of our family, and uh, for, as most of you that grew up in the church, and uh, whether it was singing out of the hymnal or, or singing with a, a lot of people, Dad liked singing. And... Uh, Thank goodness Cynthia came first because she learned how to play the piano. And uh, there were a lot of nights at home where we sang out of piano songbooks. So, I don't know, Burt Bacharach comes to mind, every show tune in history. Um, and we sang four-part harmony. So, um, Dad, Dad had a great voice and uh, could sing every part. And uh, he was often forced to sh shift from one part to another because... Either somebody was doing it wrong, so he had to sing it for them, or they were singing so wrong that they got him out of tune and he would eventually go to soprano. Um, and in my case, it was very fortunate because he kind of became my auto-tune, and when I started struggling, he'd either poke me or I would just realize how off I was, and here we'd come back to <laughs> harmony. But I uh, loved to sing, family loved to sing, and. Um, the bishop side of the family had huge reunions back in the day, and it was really all so we could get together and sing songs. And uh, there were some, some beautiful voices over there. So Dad was a guy who had just <laughs> a very staunch sense of right and wrong, immovable, you might call him, um, dedicated, very consistent. Um, and uh, story <laughs> about one quick illustratory story. When, when we were in Austria and I was in fifth grade, we, were in the, we went to the American International School, which uh, let's just say most of the students and especially the teachers were not churched. Um, and the morals were a little different. And I remember coming home of his first semester, second semester, with my stack of, I think it was 11 books. And Dad sat down with those, and we went to bed, and 
got up the next morning and he was still up with that stack of books and I'm not sure if he had actually stayed up all night reading them or if he had been skimming them and gotten up early but uh, I recognized the stare and kind of thought I was in trouble I didn't choose the books the teachers did <laughs> but uh, I don't know exactly again how it went down but my dad appeared before my teachers and my curriculum changed that year um, <laughs> And I, I can't remember exactly the bad books. I think maybe John Steinbeck wrote one of them and maybe Ray Bradbury the other one. What I do remember is it gave me the opportunity to read To Kill a Mockingbird, which my, uh, uh, to my chagrin was way longer than the other two combined. Um, but glad I read that book and uh, might never have gotten to it. But uh, Dad also, um, as I said in the... the uh, obituary, he had a lot of jobs, he didn't like most of them, um, especially the early ones which were government, um, army. Don't think he liked it, but I think he enjoyed some of the camaraderie and, and some of the uh, things he got to learn, which he was working on Morse code um, at the time he left. And uh, Anyway, I left to take care of his mother because dad was super sick and um, then kind of moved into his first real career, which was the working for the Internal Revenue Service, which I think uh, he was real proud of, but he also did not like at all. Um, and uh, he was proud of the fact that he, he uh, became and was cited for being an expert marksman with a pistol, and he still to this day has those targets that he qualified for. For some reason, he never sh learned to shoot a long gun and was always very frustrated at um, shooting birds. Um, lots of trips with Don Flint and Hensley's and, and couldn't find it in himself to shoot a big animal because I think the, eye, the eyes looked too human. Um, but uh, anyway, it was a real good pistol shot. Um, and I, I think he, he hated the enforcement part of it. Uh, he talks about, uh, talked about some breaking down doors to arrest tax cheats or breaking up stills in Oklahoma when he worked for the alcohol and tobacco tax part of it. Um, he did get to as part of that uh, assignment, he got to be on stage with uh, Presidents Johnson and Nixon in a, in a protection um, capacity when they were passing through the local town. And I think he was proud of that a little bit. Um, but again, I don't think he liked the enforcement part of it. Um, he did mention uh, he did like helping the people that he could help, and I think one particular Dallas Cowboys football player, he got to help reorganize, um, I'll kind of not mention his name for confidentiality, although the guy's dead, but evidently um, he was a very good running back. Um, those of you who follow the Cowboys will know who that was. Um, and then, you know, Dad uh, <laughs> was a bit of an adventurer. He moved around a little bit and uh, kind of seemed to have always been exploring and, and also kind of uh, found himself in a predicament or two. And he talks a lot about when he was younger how much he enjoyed his cousins. Um, and. Uh, I think at one family reunion, um, I don't remember who tells the story best these days, um, but I guess in front of a large group of people, he stuck his head between the stairs banister and couldn't get it out. <laughs> and uh, I guess the laughter was immense, which made him turn red and probably his head grow. And I, I don't know, I don't remember the part of the story that about how they got him out, but he was embarrassed about it for. 70 or 80 years. Um, and then on the kind of the cousins and when he was younger, um, <laughs> again, very staunch Church of Christ. Um, he talks about uh, he and some of his buddies and the cousins would get out a little ahead of the Baptist kids and they like to have rock fights with the Baptist kids. And I think they were. Uh, pretty competitive and like to make sure they won those fights. Um, 
but no, I'm sure that he really wasn't proud of that. Um, and then, you know, Dad just had, as I said, he didn't think you had many friends, but over 88 years, you have a lot of special acquaintances, and most of Dad's friends were, well, all of them that I knew were lifelong friends, and, and that meant that their families did life with us, which was phenomenal. Uh, we had a very expanded group of kids. Um, and I just read off a few. I think you talk about Sam Killebrew, who was his roommate in college and best man, and I don't know much about him, so I can't tell you any of those stories. Um, Gwen Hensley, who was also his brother-in-law, became his best friend. And just a lot of memories. We followed them to Austria, and again, they became a very, very close extended family. And then Uncle Gwen died early, and he became very good friends with his next brother-in-law, Ed Cole. And in the last few years, Ed became like brothers. And he would say, Ed, Ed did everything for him, so. And then Dad had a younger brother named Jack, um, who uh, my wife just found out was his brother a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, Uncle Jack lives in Oklahoma. Again, a uh, phenomenal Christian family. Uh, three cousins uh, who we were very close to. We spent a lot of weekends um, in Oklahoma. When I personally would rather have stayed in Amarillo, um, but uh, we burned up a lot of miles between Amarillo and Duncan, um, visiting them, taking care of Dad's mom, um, who lived to 98, um, and uh, great family. And then you know we talk about the Vienna years and. <laughs> I think, you know, best friends there kind of goes to <laughs> clan of friends. Uh, we were a group of people that did life together all over Europe, um, spreading the word of God, supporting each other. Smuggling Bibles um, was kind of a theme, and, uh, you know, there we got to spend lots of time at the camps, Lynn Camp, you would call another best friend, who spent not only the Austria years, but the Emerald years, and was, his dad would say one of his best friends provided a job again. We'll hear from Lynn in written form here in a little bit. Couldn't be with us, but his children are here. Again, just great memories. So much fun. Um, did I say three hours? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just a few names that come to mind from Austria, the Turners were there when we were there, and became Mark became my best friend. I think Dad and Tom would have been best ski buddies, um, which gave us a lot to do on weekends. And Dad and Tom would take Mark and I and Cynthia and Kelly, and we got to ski some of the most fabulous places in the world, some of us better than others. Um, The dads weren't really that good. Um, <laughs> and uh, Vance's and Lynette and family are here today, and Curtis's and Earnhardt's and Holtz and Harris and Austrian family, Krosnick's and Teubel's. And again, we just did life together. Don Flint, who's here, you're going to hear from earlier, and also long-term friends, and kind of related to the camps. Not kind of. Actual. Um, and Dad would have considered Don one of his best friends for many, many years, and he got to work together at Turnkey, where, again, a job he did like because of the people he worked with. Um, and there was a lot of cutting up over there, from what I understand. I think Larry Borger coined a phrase and they called him, called dad the old bugger. Um, which was 
apt, even when he was young. Terry Harmon, someone else who we thought was going to get to come today. Um, Lubbock, Amarillo, supported the work in Austria, and whose family, again, just did, just did life with us. Lots of fun. Dale Young from the Lawndale days was someone Dad really respected, and they had, well, all the boys, um, and we were all friends, Kendall, especially for me, and um, then later I went to work for Brian um, in Vienna, who tried to teach me some graphic design skills. Um, thanks, Brian. Uh, and, uh, then really talking about work again, most recently, Dad kind of found a new tribe at uh, Johnson Sewell Ford here in town, and he loved to drive cars all over the state. I'm not sure why. Um, but again, I think a lot of it was time spent with great friends and some of you from this church and uh, just camaraderie that he, he didn't have a lot of. And so finally, um, a lot of really good friends, family friends, people here at this church. And, um, you know, just the last days, Jim Carpenter and JT, Donald Manchin, so many people just helping wherever they can. It's kind of what it's all about. And uh, this church. <laughs> Well, I've cried more tears in this church than anywhere in my life. Uh, this is the third funeral I've gotten to speak at. Both grandparents, although it wasn't this building, it was on this piece of land. And uh, this church has been amazing to my family since my grandparents moved here in 78. Holly, cousin Holly, um, mentioned in some of her thoughts about dad. Um, that this church has their back and their work in Kenya too. And dad kind of helped hook that up too. And dad spent a lot of time um, at church, as you guys know, uh, mostly in the background because um, he's kind of shy first. Um, but you'd see him doing things like taking out the trash, working on the mission committee, mowing grass for people who needed it. Um, anything behind the scenes was dad. Um, hospital visits, you name it. Supporting my mom for years so that Emerald at Christian School could run. Um, and I really don't know on my dad's salary how he supported much of anything, but there wasn't ever a cause he didn't give to me time or money. And I think really here in Marble Falls, he felt about as home as he felt anywhere. Uh, when they, then when they moved here, he said the people in this area are the nicest people I've ever met. And that would go double for the people at this church right here. And again, this church loves to sing in so many great voices, which, uh, which fit him. And missions were his passion throughout. While well, he served on many committees as a deacon, etc., I think the one constant would have been missions. I think uh, one thing we hear about, have heard about for years, for instance, I think in... in when they were in Tulsa, some getting close to 60 years, I think he helped Tom Turner raise some support, and uh, so many others. Um, one more thing, because Dad was kind of funny. How did I skip over that? So four and a half hours. <laughs> Um, um, anyway, well, I'll, I'll say a couple. Dad was fun, and um, a couple of his favorite pranks were if you sat next to him at a dinner table and you didn't know him. In the old days, we had butter dishes, which actually would have soft margarine or the butter in it. My dad would do everything he could to distract you so that when you looked away and he handed you the butter dish, he would put as much of your thumb in it as, you, as he could get. And then he would spend 30 minutes laughing about it. And if he could get you a second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth time, which he did some people, it was, a, it was an accomplishment in his mind. <laughs> and then another one, so when we went to church in Vienna, uh, there was a, 
I don't know, maybe there were seven, seven or eight kind of very old uh, single ladies who, were, who loved kids and they always gave us candy. And dad had another funny joke. And a lot of this candy was filled with liquor. <laughs> or it was some combination that he didn't want to eat. Dad had all these identified and so he would eat the good stuff and save the other ones. And I think Jonathan Camp was a regular victim. Um, anybody that, again, showed up that didn't know and the kids got the liquor candy but he usually had a hanky for him to spit it in. <laughs> and uh, loved a great practical joke and loved to tease people. And if he teased you, he loved you. So um, I'm out of time at 34 minutes. Um, so we're down to two and a half hours to go. And uh, a lot of these guys that have done more of this than I have will have some better stuff to say. But thank you all and thanks for loving my dad. And uh, thank you to this church for all the support now and ongoing for my mom. Thank you.
Almost 17 years ago, I moved to Marble Falls, Texas. I knew one family here. Shortly after being here, I met the bishops. And Charlene was her usual bubbly, welcoming self. And for the life of me, I couldn't read Carol. I wasn't sure if he was going to dig my chili, if you know what I'm talking about. And I thought about him, and just over the last almost 17 years of getting to interact with him, I'm still not sure he dug my chili much. <laughs> but I really learned to love and appreciate him. And there was a phrase that came to mind when I think about Carol. Uh, its origin is uh, reportedly comes from an 1860 novel called The Mill on the Floss by a guy named George Eliot. In modernity, it was popularized in our culture in 1946 in a murder mystery known as Murder in the Glass Room by Lester Fuller. We use this phrase in conjunction with restaurants and hotels and automobiles and houses, but especially people. And God even used a version of it when he selected a king of Israel. And that phrase to me is, you can't always judge a book by its cover. So I knew that Carol was an avid reader. I didn't know what he read much until the other day other than the Bible. But I don't know, would you suspect a man from the Duncan, Oklahoma area would read? Well, uh, Louis L'Amour, Western books, okay, I get it. One that he could read, but the other, but sorry, you Okies. He did like Louis L'Amour, Western books, and I could see that he also enjoyed John Grisham novels. But then I heard uh, from Victor, he read Where the Crawdads Sing, and I'm thinking, where did that come from, right? <laughs> from Delia Owens, who was, who was a naturalist, right, who wrote stuff about Africa mostly. But he did like to read the Bible, and he was very committed to that. And one of his favorite books of the Bible was the Psalms, which he read as part of the daily ritual of biblical meditation. And when I taught Psalms the first time, I said, okay, I think we're going to get along. You know, you can't always judge a book by its cover. But with Carol, I knew this. He was a man of great spiritual depth. Carol's also a music lover. Obviously, if your great uncle is Tillett S. Tedley, uh, you would expect that he would love to listen to and sing gospel hymns, and certainly he did. And Bryce, you led that last one way too fast, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Carol also liked to listen to country music. Uh, Jim Reeves and Johnny Cash and other classic artists. I'm not sure if he liked Merle Haggard or not, but I'm pretty sure he didn't like I'm Proud to Be an Okie from Muskogee. So. <laughs> but did you know that Carol also liked to listen to the classics, Mozart and Strauss and Hayden and other Austrian composers? So you can't always judge a book by its cover. And here's what I'm sure of. You knew that Carol appreciated the giftedness that God gave others. And then I asked, why would a mild-mannered, quiet, former recovering accountant need to carry around a Smith & Wesson revolver? <laughs> well, when you're a criminal investigator for the IRS and track down lawbreakers across the country, or you go break up steals in Oklahoma with the ATF and occasionally go on raids, I guess it's, not, it's good to know that you have two friends, Nate Smith and Wesson, with you. Right? <laughs> and occasionally, as Victor told us about, you get to hang out with presidents of the United States and be their protector, protect them from potential threats. So you can't always judge a book by its cover, but I do know this. If you know Carol, you know he was a man who had a strong moral compass and it always pointed towards God. Again, why would an accountant from Oklahoma move to Vienna, Austria? We moved there, at least on one move, to work for Coca-Cola as an office manager and the work was okay. Uh, the food for him was somewhat questionable, especially when he found a chicken foot and chicken soup, but it's another story. And there were outdoor adventures, skiing and hiking, taking new roads, meeting new people, all part of the European adventure. But the real move to Austria was about putting the Bible 
in hands of folks who didn't have it, even at threat of life or imprisonment. A Bible smuggler. And he did that in the Eastern Bloc countries so that people there could have a taste of the relationship that he shared with Jesus. So you can't always judge a book by its cover. But with Carol, you knew he was a man with a heart for evangelism and to share the good message. And the more I got to know him and the more I got to hear stories about him and the more he let me into his world little by little, I realize that sometimes you can judge a book by its cover. A lot of what I shared today I didn't know about Carol until recently and in my reflections in my time in Marble Falls, I just knew Carol as a quiet, calm, dignified, mostly serious gentleman. I only knew a little of his adventurous side or his competitive side or knew very little of his whimsical side. But what I did know about him and do know about him, his family conferred with me when I met with him this week because I asked him, I said, describe Carol in one word. And here's what I got. Strong, moral, compassionate, generous, thoughtful. So Carol had a heart for family and took care not only of his parents, but Charlene's parents. Again, at no, no telling what cost, opportunity cost that, that was for him because he considered that a privilege to care for family. And Carol has a special place in his heart for children. Children served on the board of Amarillo Christian School and High Plains Children's Home. And he has a heart for widows. He would work on their cars and do things around their house. But if it didn't involve a ladder, because he no longer was allowed on those, he would go by and simply check on them. And when I think about those two things, the love for children and especially for the fatherless and love for widows, you've got to think about what James said about pure religion. And man, did he practice it. Carol loved serving in the church. He served as a deacon worship leader, served on mission committees, served in other ministries. And he did that not to gain recognition or say, look at me, or earn his way to heaven, or to be thanked. Carol simply served because it was the Jesus thing to do. See, you can't judge a book by its cover. Carol met Charlene on a blind day at Abilene Christian, I guess it was college then, right? Now that's an adventure in and of itself, right? A blind day. And shortly after that meeting, Charlene, he loved you like Christ loves his church with all that he had. You were his rock and his center. And he still loves you the same way. Carol loves his children, Cynthia and Victor, like God loves his children. His children aren't perfect. Close, but not quite, right? But I know this, they will forever, you will forever be his children. And you, he will forever love you. And you will forever carry on his legacy. So you can judge a book by its cover when the cover looks like this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When the book cover looks like this, the book cover looks like Jesus. And to me, Carol Bishop always looked like Jesus. So there was some speculation that Carol could only stand crowd and fun and social events for so long. It has been rumored that he might practice an Irish goodbye and just sign a slip out without saying much to go reflect I suspect Carol would be more than uncomfortable about what we're going on with today. He might have just simply just slipped out with an Irish goodbye and walked out of this grand event. But you know what? This man's wife is too rich and too good not to share with the people that he loves. Amen. So I'm sorry, Carol. No Irish goodbye today. Let us make a fuss over you. And let us enjoy your life together, if even for just a little while today. I thank you, Carol Bishop, for being a living, open book of Jesus to me and to this world.
Thanks you, Carol. Thank you, Carol, for allowing us to judge a book by its cover. So I've been asked to read a, a memory from Barbara and Lynn Camp, who couldn't be here today. Um, Carol Bishop, from the time we heard that Carol was failing, our thoughts have been constantly with the bishops and our blessed lives together. What began in Tempton with my mother and Carol's aunt my mother's best school friend, has continued through multiple generations. When Charlene invited us to share some memories, we were blessed again in recalling literally decades of rich experiences. <clears throat> here are a couple of the, <clears throat> here are a couple that stand out and, <clears throat> and will need to represent the total. First and foremost, I think Carol is a living definition of the word loyal. What a true, faithful, loyal friend and brother in Christ. His life indicated so clearly what really matters. And to that, we are absolutely committed. And to that, he was absolutely committed. To know him was to observe a constantly growing loyalty to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He submitted to the Lord's leading when he met Charlene and pledged his life to her. Family took a proper priority with Carol as son, husband, and father. His faithfulness to the Lord's people, the Church of Jesus Christ, was legendary wherever he went. At work, he modeled dependability as employee and as an advisor. In the host of friendship relationships that he leaves will witness an eternity to his sterling fidelity. Carol also had a wonderful ability to find humor in almost every circumstance in life. That wry grin he gave unmistakably to an almost under the breath comment he was ready to share. At times, it was just an amazingly fitting nickname for a less than pleasant person. I always wondered if he had one for me. <clears throat> in every case, he received, in every case, he helped diffuse more than a few explosive, explosive situations. <clears throat> He often had, we often had lunch together as employees of turnkey computer systems in Amarillo. It seems that his favorite choice was first cafeteria. <clears throat> there, we were always greeted. <clears throat> in the, there we were always greeted in the serving line by a special needs young woman who put together our salads. She would give us a broad smile of recognition and then shyly ask, may I help ye? May I, may I help you? Carol never <clears throat> tired of hearing her accented query. In addition, he always wanted me to order liver and onions so that he can have the onions. <laughs> oh, the joys of fellowship and friendship are too many and numerous to count. How we miss him already. 
that our lives are surely richer and the prospect of eternity together is certainly sweeter because we were privileged to know him. God, we thank you for <clears throat> Carol Ray Bishop. And may the Lord bless your lean and her children with all kinds of peace and comfort. Barbara and Lynn. After reading Carol's obituary, obituary, hard to say that word, I realized there were many chapters uh, to Carol's life. My wife and I have had the privilege of participating in one of those chapters. I think the first time that I met Carol, it was in the late 70s when I went to work for Turnkey Computer Systems in Amarillo. And Carol worked in accounting and I worked in software development. We were a small company in our, uh, that was started by my brother-in-law, Lynn Camp. And the company employed a lot of family members and close friendships. And Carol was one of those friends who had previously worked with Lynn and Gwen, as we talked about before, um, in, in Vienna during that time. Carol and I had a lot, of, a lot in common uh, based on our families, our jobs, and our church connections. Our friendship gained momentum when our wives started teaching together. We both were men who were blessed with wonderful wives who too became the very best of friends. They taught together for over 10 years. Over the years, we enjoyed being together and the benefits of close friendships. We shared many times together, company activities, church events, school activities, I wasn't going to mention about the hunting because of the long gun problem, but uh, that, was another, <laughs> that was another activity we participated in from time to time. And we always tried to celebrate our birthdays together in the fall. When Charlene asked me that if I might say a few words uh, at his memorial service, I've been considering just what would I say about my friend Carol. And my first thoughts, uh, <clears throat> was he was trustworthy and he was loyal. And the passage from Micah 6 and 8 comes to mind. Uh, what does the Lord require of you to, but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? And this was the kind of person I witnessed in Carol. He was a kind, humble, and fair man. He was comfortable to be with. You could be yourself when you were with him. On more than one occasion, we would leave our dog and or our youngest son with Carol and Charlene when we needed to be out of town. Now that is trust, especially when it comes to your dog. <laughs> we last visited with Carol and Charlene back in January, and it was a good visit and a reminder of how much we missed being with them since they moved away from Amarillo. Carol was suffering then, but he was still cheerful. I love the words to the song, No Scars in Heaven, and how much they <clears throat> apply to Carol right now. If I, only, <clears throat> if I had only known the last time would be the last time, I would have put off all the things I had to do. I would have stayed a little longer, held on a little tighter. Now what I'd give for one more day with you. Because there's a wound here in my heart where something's missing. And they tell me that it's going to heal with time. But I know you're in a place where all your wounds have been erased. And knowing yours are healed is healing mine. The only scars in heaven, they won't belong to me and you. There will be no such things that are broken. And all the old will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile now, even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold you now. Carol is greatly missed, for we loved him.
Life's fabric now has a big hole in it that will be slow to mend. But we are so thankful to God for allowing us to participate together in the life of Carol Ray Bishop. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we know that you are the creator of the universe, and for this we praise you. We thank you, Father, for your beautiful promises given to us in your word. And most of all, we thank you for giving your only son, Jesus the Christ, through whom we have eternal life. We thank you, Father, for the heroes of faith in the Bible, for, for the example that they set. We thank you so much for the example of so many Christian men who have been our examples for living the Christian life. And Father Carol Bishop was for certain one of those men. Carol had such a strong faith in you and your son, which he exhibited throughout his life. He exemplified Christ in school, at work, as a husband, as a father, and as a friend. He was loved by so many as exemplified by all these folks here today. We thank you, Father, for Carol and for a life well lived. Father, we pray for blessings of comfort and peace for Shirley and for Cynthia and Victor, and for the entire family. And Father, we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
we need to be comforted, and what's better comfort food than blue dot ice cream? So, <laughs> so we do have, uh, we're over in the fellowship uh, room, we'll have uh, ice cream if you want to stay today and get a chance to love the bishops a bit and share our story or two about care. We'd love for you to do that. Uh, so if you would, just play, remain seated if the bishop's family will lead us out and we will go uh, indulge in some blue dot. 